of them? Yes. Thanks very much, Dana. Um, and thank you to everyone joining in person and online. We are delighted to have a terrific panel here. Um, I'll introduce them, and then we will jump right into the content. Um, first, we have Toral Patel from the Inter Foundation, where she's a program officer. She works closely with the Foundation's field offices in 18 countries to support the development of urban and environmental programs across a range of issue areas, including climate change adaptation, disaster risk management, green growth, and natural resource management. Next, we have Thea Anderson, who's the Director for Financial Inclusion at Mercy Corps. There, she designs and supports market-driven initiatives and spearheads the agency's strategy and implementation for market-driven financial services with a focus on private sector partnerships and on non-traditional applications. Last but certainly not least, we have Henry Flores from Save the Children. He's an expert in disaster management, capacity building for regional and local governments, and democratic governance and market systems. He has extensive knowledge of support mechanisms, humanitarian aid processes, inter-organizational coordination, and early recovery and construction. Henry's colleague Jorge Sanz is also joining him to, join, to assist with translation needs. Jorge is a senior disaster risk reduction and resilience specialist based here in Washington, D.C. Jorge provides technical assistance to Save the Children country offices in Latin America, Southeast Asia, and the Pacific in the development and implementation of DRR and climate change adaptation proposals and projects. Um, we will turn it over to Toral now. Um, let me just check with our AV folks on the feedback. Are we okay with that? Okay, fantastic. Um, in the meantime, we will move to Toral, who will discuss the Asia Foundation's programs in Vietnam. Good morning. Um, thank you for being here. I'm presenting on behalf of my colleagues in Vietnam who unfortunately couldn't be here this morning. They've been, uh, they've been implementing uh, the program Strengthening Public-Private Partnerships for Community Resilience for about the past five years. Um, I'll start by providing the results and the lessons learned. So as you probably know, Vietnam is one of the most hazard-prone countries in the world with its long coastline and monsoon climate. Uh, every year it faces significant flooding and storm surges um, with worsening consequences due to climate change and rapid urbanization. Recently there's been a substantial increase in the number of development projects that are focused on community-based DRM. But for the most part, these projects don't include the private sector. And we saw this as a major gap since we think that community resilience uh, depends greatly on the ability of the private sector to bounce back, reestablish production, and continue to, continue to provide employment to local workers in the aftermath of a disaster. So we identified two key issues in particular through a review of DRM efforts in Vietnam and stakeholder consultations. First, we found that disaster preparedness and planning among businesses is at a very basic level due to a lack of information and capacity. Second, we found that while, business, while Vietnamese businesses, especially large-scale businesses, uh, contribute to disaster relief efforts, their support tends to be ad hoc and ineffective. Their giving is largely case by case and rarely integrated into a broader CSR strategy or aligned with other response efforts. The government of Vietnam has recognized the need for improved private sector engagement, but both the government and business community lack model programs or strategies for collaboration. So in light of these issues, uh, we initiated our program to build a DRM capacity for Vietnamese businesses in all these hazard-prone areas. So we chose to focus on small and medium enterprises, which I'll call SMEs. In Vietnam, SMEs make up an important part of the economy, employing between 80 and 90 percent of the population and producing over 40 percent of the GDP. And just a quick note on definition, in Vietnam, small uh, is small enterprises, 10 between 10 and 200 employees, and medium is between 200 and 300 employees. Each, each country, I think, has a different definition. Um, but overall, SMEs in Vietnam are poorly prepared for disasters. In a survey we conducted in 2011, over 80% of SMEs reported that they had no disaster preparedness or response plans, and over 60% reported that they had no disaster risk insurance. The survey also showed a significant gap between awareness and action on climate change. 67% of SMEs indicated awareness of climate-related risks, 
but only 20% had developed long-term risk management strategies. So in light of this, uh, since 2011, with support from OFTA, the Asia Foundation has been implementing a program to build effective and sustainable disaster risk management in Vietnam. We focused on strengthening public-private partnerships, building the capacity of SMEs, and promoting disaster-related corporate social responsibility, or CSR. So to achieve these objectives, we've been working through strategic partnerships with the government, businesses, and NGOs. Um, one of our main partners is the Vietnam Chamber of Commerce and Industry, which is the largest business chamber association in the country. We're also working with the Small and Medium Enterprises Development Support Center, which is a government organization that provides trainings and services to SMEs. Then we're working with the NGO Center for Education and Development, which has facilitated access to business communities throughout the country. Second, we developed a, see, we developed a training course to help SMEs identify and manage disaster risk. Uh, this training course includes modules such as risk assessment, mitigation strategies, and supply chain planning, among many others. Um, and then to deliver these courses, we developed a local network of trainers. Third, we developed guidelines for effective disaster-related CSR. These guidelines aim to shift the focus of business giving away from post-disaster relief and more on supporting preparedness in communities through various awareness and outreach activities. Fourth, we facilitated dialogues between disaster authorities and business communities to discuss best practices uh, and build cooperation on DRM. And then finally, we conducted an extensive media campaign, including radio and television broadcasts, as well as print and online media, that highlighted the role of businesses in building community resilience. So between 2011 and 2015, the program has achieved quite a lot. Um, some highlights include documenting the state of disaster preparedness in Vietnam, developing a hub of expertise uh, for the business community. We created a network of 127 master trainers, as well as an online platform for knowledge sharing. Um, the program has enhanced the capacity of SMEs to manage disaster risks. We've trained nearly 3,000 individuals from 2,025 SMEs across uh, 20 provinces and cities in Vietnam. Hundreds of these SMEs have taken follow-up actions, including the development of their own DRM plans for business. The program has also just raised general awareness of the private sector's role in building community resilience. So for lessons learned, we've learned quite a bit over the past few years. We found that one, SMEs have short time horizons, um, horizons, sorry, <laughs> have short time horizons and low management capacity. They tend to confront problems as they occur rather than plan in advance. Their focus on short term concerns makes it very difficult to engage them in long-term discussions about climate change or disaster. We learned that targeting the right businesses is critical. And by this, I mean we've had much greater success in engaging businesses that have faced disaster-related losses in the past than those that have not. We also learned that engaging leaders is a good strategy for disseminating knowledge. Businesses that sent their managers or other senior staff to our trainings we're, much, we're far more likely to take follow-up actions on improving their DRM than businesses that sent other staff. Finally, we found that building partnerships with local institutions that are trusted by the community, the business community in particular, was key to gaining traction for a project. And then finally, um, we will be beginning our fifth and final phase of the program this year that will focus on securing the long-term impacts of the program. In addition to continuing trainings and technical support for SMEs, the project will expand trainings to uh, industrial zones and economic zones. I apologize for the typo here. Um, in two provinces, we'll focus on expanding to industrial parks. There are over 280 across the country. Um, and we'll, set a, we'll develop a set of guidelines to promote further expansion nationwide. Phase five will also establish a network of experienced trainers to facilitate access to information and resources after the project's end. It will integrate resilience concepts and methodologies from the training courses into existing courses that are offered at business training centers and universities to make sure that they continue to reach business leaders. The project will also work to improve the policy environment for private sector engagement in DRM 
specifically through the development of a white paper and various multi-stakeholder forums. And finally, it will build alliances with other NGOs. Well, <laughs> it will build alliances with other NGOs uh, that are now working in this area to share knowledge and best practices. So that's all I have for now. I will look forward to your questions. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Thea Anderson uh, with Miss Mercy Corps, and I'm really excited to discuss the Indonesia Liquidity Facility After Disaster Initiative that we're implementing um, in Indonesia with OFTA. But first, I just want to say uh, just a few words about our global resilience strategy and how it relates to the, the facility. So at Mercy Corps, uh, resilience has really been an agency priority since 2012, and that's included investing heavily both in our programming, our staff, and in our research initiatives. We have three resilience hubs, uh, one in Niger that's focused on West Africa, in Nairobi focused on East Africa, and then for Southeast Asia focused on Indonesia, which supports the initiative that I'll discuss today. So the word resilience is used quite frequently and often can mean many things, <laughs> as many in the room, people in the room are shaking their heads. So I just want to quickly go over what, when I say resilience at Mercy Corps, what, what that actually means. So for us, we define resilience as actors, that could be communities, businesses, and in this case, financial institutions, ability to cope, adapt, and transform in the face of shocks, stresses, and it's growing more in, in the world we work in today, especially where Mercy Corps works, a complex crises. So for us, resilience is a process. It's not an end state. It's a way of thinking and acting and influencing um, all the different technical sectors in which we work. Our approach is framed around four different questions, which I'll go through quickly now, but I think as part of the Q&A, we can go into to more detail if there's any questions. So one, um, we, we, at first, we asked the four questions to help us really understand what are the different interconnected systems um, related to um, the, the different shocks and stresses that we're trying to address. So one is the resilience of what? Um, what geography are specifically trying to target? And within that geography, what are the economic systems, the social systems, and the ecological systems that we're trying to address? Two is around resilience for whom? What population are we specifically trying to reach? So that as we're designing our program and implementing and doing uh, research, we're, we're keeping that in mind. Um, and also recognizing, especially when we're talking about natural disasters, that vulnerability can vary significantly um, across different geographies and around different social and economic groups. So three is around resilience to what, and that's obviously specific shocks um, we're addressing. And then the fourth is around resilience through what. And this refers to different actors' capacities. So their absorptive capacity, their short-term ability to actually um, cope with different shocks, the adaptive capacity, which is the longer-term abilities, and then what we're really trying to get to is tr transformative capacity. So the ability to facilitate systemic change, so address, addressing some of the underlying dynamics in the system over the long term. So um, similar to Vietnam, which is maybe why we're also on the panel, is Indonesia is also one of the most disaster-prone areas in, in the world. Earthquakes, tsunamis, volcanoes, but also quite often a cyclical with high winds, flooding, and droughts. So the ILFAT initiative, which is Indonesia Liquidity uh, Facility After Disaster, has really allowed us to increase the three capacities uh, for a wide range of financial institutions and their clients in some of Indonesia's areas that are most prone to catastrophic disasters um, and ongoing shocks like, like flooding and, and, and even in some cases droughts. Um, one of the reasons that we've um, targeted financial institutions is because we wanted to make sure that fi the financial system would be able to respond, to be able to cushion the effects of disaster, help uh, speed recovery efforts, and ideally stabilize the, the financial sector post-disaster. Right now, um, with the initiative, we've been working around with around 160 MFIs. Uh, when, and when I say MFIs in the Indonesia context, it's a wide range of types of financial institutions. So that includes small commercial banks as well as cooperatives. Um, so financial in institutions will serve as a critical and immediate vehicle to financing uh, directly after disasters to help people repair, replace businesses, replace assets, and often also to uh, provide short-term consumption needs. So, for example, there's an earthquake. On the demand side, for a financial institution, there's often a, a high run on savings. Clients want to withdraw funds quickly and immediately to buy necessities to start rebuilding. These same clients often also need new loans to start rebuilding. And there's also high, usually a high demand for new clients that are looking for either short-term credit or long-term credit. 
But from the supply side, from the financial institution itself, they're also usually affected by these disasters. Whether physically, the branch, or different delivery channels, even if it's mobile network operators, their infrastructure can be damaged. And the staff of the financial institutions are also hit by the same earthquake. And also, um, for the financial institutions, savings balances are significantly reduced as people request their loans, which is at the exact same time that clients have new credit demands. Clients, typically, that are also affected by the disaster usually need a couple of months uh, to be able to, to repay on time as their cash flow is for, used for more urgent needs. So to address this mis mismatch, um, Mercy Corps designed the, the, the OFAD initiative. And it, there's three main components. Um, one is around capacity building and liquidity management of the financial institutions to help them prepare for and respond to disasters. So that includes stress tests on operations, development of standard operating procedures, scenario planning, what staff will do what, how the financial institution will actually access its cash, uh, data protection for clients. A lot of the institutions still keep everything in paper records, moving those towards cloud-based systems, and also general liquidity plan planning and contingency planning uh, for loan loss reserves as well as loan restructuring policies. Two is looking at financial products. Um, that the financial institution itself could offer, which tend to be focused on savings is, is primarily, but also quite a bit on insurance bundled with those savings, and that's at the client level. And the area that we're, we're working in more and more, which I'll get to a little bit later, is around the portfolio level insurance for the financial institutions. Um, when I say portfolio level insurance, it's specifically for catastrophic disaster insurance, um, specifically volcanoes and, and earthquakes. And the, the third area is the liquidity fund within itself. And the liquidity fund allows MFIs who are members, they pay, they pay dues, they, they join, um, to really stabilize their liquidity and absorb short-term loan losses after, after the disaster. And so what that actually looks like in practice is before the disaster, a financial institution has a loan portfolio, they have a savings portfolio. Um, but after disaster, when we combined the, we bundled the access to liquidity and the portfolio insurance, it allows clients to be able to actually withdraw their savings, the financial institution to be able to issue new credit, as well as absorb the time period when existing clients can repay their loans. And from the portfolio level insurance, it allows the uh, financial institution to cover a portion of their non-performing loan, as well as um, even potential physical um, needs that the, the financial institution has. So this really allows, in a disaster, the financial institutions to continue operating service clients. And so, obviously, the financial institutions themselves are, are our private sector partners, but we also have played a large role in facilitating relationships with uh, Indonesian insurance companies, as well as larger um, international insurance companies. So, for example, we've worked quite closely with Swiss Re, which is a global reinsurance company, um, to help them with the design of the portfolio insurance products specific to earthquakes. And um, with International Finance Corporation, the IFC, we've been an intermediary between IFC and the financial institutions. Again, helping with the design of, of specific products as well as the rollout and marketing of those products. As well as working with MFIs to, to research what those products actually need to look like based on recent experiences with, with earthquakes. And so the key takeaways um, that we've had from, from ILFED has been going on about four years, and it's been several different phases, and we've learned quite a bit from those phases, which we'll discuss in a little bit. But I think the key takeaways I have is that you know, financial services are an essential building block of resilience, but we also need to remember that the financial system and the financial institutions are also very vulnerable, especially in, the, in catastrophic disasters. There's, there's a need for both um, short-term products as well as longer term um, products to support both ad absorptive and adaptive capacities. And I think the, the third piece that, that we found is really right from the beginning of the initiative is engaging on enabling the, the financial environment, especially around the different in types of insurance products and due to the nature of Indonesia, several different types of financial institutions that we, we work with. Yeah, um, so because of the interference, um, we've kind of all been turning your microphones on and off. Yeah, so um, if you look at your mic and you want to make sure there's a green light on it, uh, just press mute until the green light comes on, then you know, and when you hear yourself, that we can hear your voice. Okay, thank you all. Yeah, um, can I have speaker? 
Uh, yeah, I'm here uh, representing um, Save the Children Peru and Henry Flores, and our presentation is going to be about the, uh, the project that we implemented starting in 2012 in uh, Lima, in one of the municipalities in Lima. Uh, the name of the project is Apoyo a la Reducción de Riesgos en Barrios de Lima, which actually makes it up to be a nice acronym, ARRIBA. Translation will be uh, supporting the risk reduction in neighborhoods in Lima. Okay, uh, we've been given like nine. Can you can everyone hear me? Okay, we've been given like nine uh, limit of nine slides uh, for this presentation. So I just want to do the overview and the background, just a cappella. So <laughs> let's take one slide like that. Okay, so just to put you guys in the context, um, uh, Lima uh, is built in a desert, 42 district in the city. Um, we work in one uh, municipality called Villa El Salvador, uh, VES. Just to throw another acronym there. Um, high population, over half a million people in a very small state, built on unstable soil with very poor construction practices. It is a very young district. Uh, it was uh, built as part of an occupation of the land in the 1970s, and also is young because the majority of the people that live in Villa El Salvador are 40% below 20 years old and 75% under the age of 40. Um, as far as exposure, uh, it's exposed to both uh, natural hazards and man-made hazards. Uh, having an uh, issue with uh, being in a location which is prone to earthquakes and landslides, and also it has a prevalent issue of violence and youth uh, gangs. So we're looking at both man-made and natural hazards here. Uh, also, it has a high uh, socioeconomic vulnerability. In perfect, now I got it. Okay, so what was uh, yeah? So uh, we have a Sina Herlo, Law, a National System of Disaster Risk Management, that places responsibility on regional and municipal governments. It splits the responsibility of DRM into two bodies. One is investing, which deals with anything that is related to response, and center press, everything that is disaster risk reduction, mitigation, adaptation, preparedness. Okay? Uh, one of the main issues that we try to adapt with this project it is that. Uh, while uh, Center Pred and Indesi give uh, guidelines on how uh, for uh, governments to do uh, disaster risk management in the territory, it doesn't trickle down to neighborhood level activities. So that's one of the main outcomes that we have with the project. Okay? Um, so now I'm just going to refer to this. So, what do we mean by the neighborhood approach? It is bringing neighborhoods as, and also multi level stakeholders, talking about Indesi, Center Pred, Municipality of Lima, Municipality of Villa El Salvador into the uh, inception and implementation of the project, okay? The idea is that all the data that we collect at the neighborhood level as part of the project, it will inform uh, policy making in Villa Salvador, and also that uh, data will be part of um, disaster risk management um, um, decision making in the municipality. One of the main uh, challenges, or one of the uh, what I wanted to do with this project, it was, uh, like we see in many other places that we work on, there is a very uh, reactive approach in all the countries that we work in. We wanted to change more into the reactive, into the proactive. So moving more uh, to the part of uh, risk assessment, risk management, and preparedness. Um, one of the keys uh, of this project and of the neighborhood approach that we take in Villa Salvador, it is uh, the importance of involving local businesses and markets as a key component in the planning, implementation, and integration of all DRR-related services and activities. Uh, the idea is that these uh, markets and services, uh, providers of services in uh, Villa Salvador, will play a key role in neighborhood-based disaster risk management um, uh, planning. So I just felt like we just put together like a little uh, here about like uh, what is the the project Arriba, what does it entail? So the key of the project was to actually work uh, supporting the formation or strengthening existing neighborhood platforms. One of the main issues that we got when we arrived in Villa Salvador, it was that they uh, because it was created as an occupation, it had like very great. Uh, a neighborhood level organization, a lot of civil society uh, in the area of intervention, but they were all over the place. They were not talking to each other and they were not organized. So what we did with the project is consolidate all these existing neighborhood associations into one, into a neighborhood neighborhood uh, platform. Okay. Um, the idea will be uh, to link these um, neighborhood platforms to the municipal office with a neighborhood participation uh, um, office. And more or less, it's seven to eight people in these uh, in these uh, platform um, neighborhood platforms. As part of the project, since most of the uh, a lot of the activities were about the economic recovery and market systems, is to ensure that people that own a local business that actually uh, pay, play an integral part on these neighborhood platforms. Okay, so yeah, working at three different levels. Here we have uh, then the platforms. 
We were working also building the capacity of uh, municipal management authorities in El Salvador and in the municipality of Lima to be able to implement uh, the Sinajar law in the territory, and then also uh, ensuring that with these neighborhood platforms, these uh, uh, neighborhoods were taking an active role in uh, disaster risk management in the neighborhood, from the risk assessment part of it, coming up with activities to reduce, mitigate, or adapt the risk, and also increasing the preparedness to emergencies. Um, the goal of the project was to end up in all the platforms that we had, having the community uh, um, or neighborhood level disaster risk management plan linked to the uh, municipal level uh, plan. But the most important part was actually the livelihood story that we took on the ERMS sector to ensure that it would fit into this queue. Okay. Okay. And I another graph here. So what was the, the process? Uh, now we're going to go straight into ERMS. What was the process of involving market, involving markets and businesses into uh, the project? Okay. The, oh, sorry. First thing that we did it was um, an emergency market mapping and analysis. It's a tool that is usually used in emergencies to see how uh, markets were impacted after an emergency, to see if we actually were able to absorb the shocks and stresses. But we actually use it from less of a reactive approach to a proactive approach. We wanted to take a baseline maps of key value chains identified by communities that as critical to their uh, lives and livelihoods and ensure that during an emergency, they will actually be able to bounce back or ensure that the interruption of those services was minimized either no interruption at all, or that it could be uh, back to normal bounce back with a minimum amount of time, okay? So that's the part, that's the part with the analysis of the uh, livelihoods here. Then one of the main things that we did in the project was actually uh, bring in, we wanted to work with uh, identified uh, businesses on uh, supporting them to do the disaster risk management plans. Uh, one of the, uh, I don't want to say like obstacles that we had at the beginning, but if, uh, we actually work around it was that most of these uh, businesses were not uh, formalized. There's a lot of informal um, businesses there, and we couldn't work with them because we're working in coordination with the government, so we couldn't work them. So we, uh, along with uh, the local development, uh, I'm sorry, along with the local development um, office, we work in actually formalizing these businesses. Um, Working with uh, the uh, Banco de Crédito de Peru, Peru we um, supported uh, in these businesses in actually doing two things. One, we realized that these um, businesses didn't have any um, business and financial management skills. So before we started working on the business um, risk management aspect of it, we did a series of trainings that was conducted by uh, volunteers from the uh, Banco de Crédito de Peru on businesses on how to do these uh, proper financial and business management. After that, and then we work on the businesses again doing the disaster risk management plans to ensure that they could come up with, again, the same thing with the community, with identifying the risk and with hazard mitigation measures to reduce the risk to the neighborhoods. Once again, the key here is that these businesses were identified as those providing key services to the neighborhood during non-emergency times, okay? The next part, it will be, um, uh, supporting uh, with um, the Banco de Crédito de Peru, uh, the, um, these businesses are creating the, uh, the disaster risk management action plan, okay? And then we're going to go straight to number six. It will be like, what can we do when these businesses come up with the uh, actions to reduce or to mitigate uh, risk in their businesses? What can we do so they can actually implement these activities? One of the main issues that we experience in many of the, uh, the developing contexts that we work on, it is that... Um, Urban dwellers do not have access to loans, they don't have access to, um, um, to same things, so we wanted to ensure that we could get that. Once these businesses were formalized, like I said, we started with a number of businesses. Some of them didn't decide to go to get formalized, but we still gave them the training. We still gave them the training on financial and business management, but others, in order to apply, uh, one of the key aspects of the project was that in order to implement the activities that they came up with, uh, we will uh, give them first a microloan, that they would have to pay over 12 months, and then after they have paid the micro loan, which was linked to the disaster risk management action plan, they will be able to get a grant. Most of the activities that a uh, business came up with, uh, they were um, expensive and they wouldn't be uh, covered by just the loan. So that's what we came up with the grant as part of the uh, of the funds. Okay? Um, and then the last thing, it will be um, uh, what do we do about the lessons there? How do we do so these uh, businesses, these markets that we work on became champions and they can actually um, bring the experience to others, uh, other, 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 um, 
other businesses. So one of the examples that we have is one of the big markets that we work on, and actually uh, it's called the Mercado Unión del Progreso. They uh, developed their, they were actually one of the champions in this project. They developed their, their risk management plans. They had a fire like a few years ago, so they were actually very aware of this. And now they have become like um, a, a model uh, that we're actually taking into our new project that we're doing uh, under all the funds in Carabaillo, another municipality. So they are being used as this is a sample of how we should do things and working with us on that. Okay. Uh, the next one here is uh, another big important part of the project which is establishing private and public partnerships. Um, one of the keys of this project that is actually going to be a bit of a um, contradiction is we have uh, the involvement, the key involvement of the local and municipal economic development office in the project. Uh, one of the key aspects and one of the main successes that we had in the project, it is working with those neighborhood platforms. We actually managed to secure uh, 7 million um, uh, dollars, which is like around $2 million conduct additional activities to reduce risk in the neighborhoods. Um, when Sina Herlo was established in 2011, the central level government established two um, funds for uh, municipal governments to apply for funds. One is called the uh, PP068 and one is the Fonny Prail. And it's, like I said, availability of funds to disaster risk management at the municipal level. We work together with, with uh, the municipality in Villa Salvador. We work together with the data from uh, the neighborhood platforms, and we actually managed, like I said, to apply for um, another seven million uh, solids, and we got them to do mostly uh, hardware uh, interventions in the in the neighborhood. Okay, so I think it's a pretty big success. And now, what I already touched upon is the um, the importance of working with the Banco de Crédito de Peru. Um, they provided not only uh, the materials for the training, when the, for the full part of the business and the financial management of the uh, of the um, of the of the businesses, but also with the training and supported the process from day one up until the end when they got the certification. Um, one of the um, main points here as well is uh, we realized that uh, promoting the formation of neighborhood level small business associations. Uh, and the inclusion of these associations that we created into the neighborhood platforms. That was the key uh, uh, part of this project, ensure that those small business associations were part of the, uh, the neighborhood platforms, okay? Um, so now, the lessons learned and hopefully applied. One, one of the main things that we have in this project is that it was a two-year project, we ended in 2014, but at the end of 2014, we were actually awarded another uh, source of funds for another project in Caraballo. So most of the lessons learned on this uh, on this project we're actually applying them now in Caraballo, which is another one of the 42 municipalities in Lima. Uh, so what are the strengths? Uh, what we see in the strengths in this project? Okay, um, we we'll say strength uh, strengthened management capacity of local business and markets, so increasing uh, their absorber resilience, uh, increased uh, access to uh, these markets and these uh, small businesses uh, to microcredit uh, uh, programs for all these businesses, and uh, in order to achieve sustainability, we have created in Villa Salvador, I would like to say that we have created a, a environment of supply and demand for DRR and DRM uh, disaster risk management related services. So areas of improvement, I mean, there's only two bullets, but they could be might as well 2025. Um, um, and this is the part that it was a bit of a contradiction. Um, the lack of government engagement in some parts of the project, uh, especially with the local development economic office. Um, we still managed to get seven million extra uh, solids to these projects, but we had very little support from the local development uh, office. Uh, I think it was an issue uh, of lack of understanding of the project, even though we tried to familiarize all stakeholders with it, but they, we didn't have any buy-in from their side. So that's one part that we're definitely uh, working on in the new project. Uh, another area of improvement is um, what we experienced in, uh, also in Vietnam, as our colleague here was explaining, is that local businesses and, and many times communities prioritize short-term benefits or the long-term investments that it will actually take to invest in DRR. So that's something that we need to work around, okay? And open to ideas as well. Uh, again, another issue that we saw that we worked around is the problem of many of the businesses uh, not wanting to be formalized. Uh, it brings a series of accountability. It brings uh, some payments that they need to make, so they just don't want to be formalized, which it had an effect on an impact on them not being able to access these micro loans. Uh, like I said, still, even though they did not access the micro loans, we still work with them as part of the training so they could strengthen their financial business management uh, capabilities. Um, 
Another issue that we mm -hmm. want to work, uh, we're actually working in Caraballo now, is involving this uh, Office of uh, Neighborhood Participation from the get-go. Uh, this is something that we're doing in Caraballo now, and it will definitely support the sustainability of those neighborhood platforms. Okay? I'm almost. I have one more. I have two more slides. Okay, let's, I don't know what happened. So lessons learned. Uh, again, so there's a lot. Um, that we need to take a more flexible approach in the new uh, area of intervention, and we've done that from the beginning. We need to strengthen businesses before undertaking DR-related activities. We went with the idea that, okay, we're going to ensure that these businesses has, by the end of the project, the, uh, the disaster risk, uh, risk management action plans. We realized that there was a lot of work that needed to be done first. How to run their business, how to be uh, uh, financially savvy, so we worked on that before. Okay? Now we have all the materials or the, uh, that we got from uh, the project of the Banco de Crédito del Perú that we are utilizing in Caraballo. Okay? Um, it's very important to have the involvement of like, actual markets in all the art related activities, as they play a key role in the communities. And we need to involve the municipality in the livelihood strategy to ensure the sustainability of project activities. We did have an impact, but we need to ensure that not only we have impact of our activities, but what is the long-term, short-term, and long-term sustainability. Okay? And that's something that we're getting now in Caraballo with the lessons learned from this one, plus also being a longer-term project, which is three years instead of two. Um, and like I said, in, uh, this kind of encompasses everything. Integrating, integrating lessons learned from Arriba into the future projects. Um, one of the main things that we learned is that uh, the project activities, the strategy of the project needs to be validated and institutionalized by the municipality. The project activities are part of the tools used by the, uh, by the local, and then we need to ensure that the project activities are part of the local development plan that we have for the years. So now in Calabarillo, uh, all the projects that we have under the economic recovery and market systems are part of the municipal development plan for 2015 and 2016. What does this mean? That they're actually prioritizing those activities for the next two years. Uh, I think that's pretty much it. I have one more thing. So, I mean, key takeaways, I'm just, I don't want to bore you anymore, but uh, business and markets are different from community leaders and grassroots organizations. So they have other motivations uh, not related to their neighborhoods. They're more individualistic, so we need to work on that to ensure that we actually achieve this neighborhood approach. Uh, their priority is their business, not so much uh, the neighborhood. And it's not always easy to link up the neighborhood with the risk that businesses remain isolated. Okay? And the last one is like businesses have two roles in disaster risk management. One is strengthening themselves to be more resilient to disasters, and two, support neighborhoods in the event of a disaster by being a reference point, a point of reference in the community. Okay, so for example, we're talking about hardware stores, local stores, and social programs. So this is our presentation. So when, if you guys are going to open to the QA next, any questions, I will direct them to Henry, and I'll just translate the, the answers because this is his moment to shine. So thank you. Thank you um, to all of our panelists so much. Um, what we're going to do now is um, I just want to share a couple of sort of overall takeaways, and then we will move to the Q&A section. Um, we'll first have a brief moderated Q&A up here, and then we will open it up to the participants in the room as well as online. Um, for the other speakers and the panelists, just so we can avoid the feedback, if you can take a look at your mic and make sure it's on mute, so it should be a little orange light or off. Um, and then when you're speaking, you can click it so that it has a green light. Um, that will, I think, save our audio participants listening online. Um, so just a few things that I think I wanted to um, pull out sort of from these. Um, one of them, I think, is just the fact that this is really a continuous iterative process. I think all of the projects that have been described here are ones that took place over several years. And we're kind of constantly adjusting. The end game didn't look like it did originally. Um, I think we'll hopefully get a little bit more into that. Um, you know, but every time things changed a little bit, um, and I really liked what Toril had said, especially about getting those right key businesses on board. Um, you know, not everybody is going to get it about DRR, I think, right away, um, and really kind of making businesses want it. And I like how Henry and Jorge put it for creating demand for DRR. Um, I think the extent to which you can't separate the community from local businesses is really critical. Um, that private sector engagement requires partnering with a lot more than just the private sector. 
Um, you know, you really have to reach out to local governments, to regulators, to disaster risk management bodies, um, the folks who are going to kind of keep this around afterwards, um, which is really another key takeaway, I think, is how to institutionalize this kind of thing um, and working on the enabling environment, be that for um, resilient financial services or for supporting critical markets that you think would be essential in a disaster. Um, or just for helping small and medium enterprises build their disaster resilience. Um, again, the flexibility, I think, and this iterative approach is something that really jumps out at me. Um, I've had the privilege of being able to visit two of the three projects and then kind of follow all of them for years. And the extent to which things change and, OK, we thought we were going to do this, but we need to sort of adjust it. Um, I know in Peru, for example, um, one key adjustment that you guys made was putting somebody in with the local government um, all of the time so that you could really institutionalize that relationship. Um, I know for Mercy Corps, they had all of their partnerships sort of all lined up and ready to go, and then some people left and some people changed their minds, and so then, boom, we're back to square one. It's going to take us months to get more partnerships set up. Um, so really just kind of having that that critical planning, that process, really picking who you're going to partner with and that that's going to be more than the private sector. Um, I'm going to stop talking now because I think that's less interesting and take it to the panel. Um, so again, if you're going to contribute, just make sure that your microphone is green and then that it's not when you're not speaking. Um, oops, sorry. Uh, so just a few things that I, I really just want to pull out. Um, a couple of you, I know your projects really had a lot around changing, really changing self-perceptions of businesses. Um, you know, whether they're just too wrapped up in the day-to-day, -day, we're just trying to make a living, um, or not seeing themselves as being part either of the greater community, not seeing their business continuity as being wrapped up in community disaster risk management. Um, I don't know if some of you would maybe like to share some thoughts or stories around that. I'm thinking particularly from Vietnam and Peru, um, but Dia, you might have some as well. Um, well, a couple of things. Uh, the, it's about self-perception amongst businesses, but also the broader perception. One thing we found. Uh, I'm sorry. Can you also hold the microphone closer to your mouth? Thank you. Yeah. Appreciate it. Yeah. They're not very sensitive. No Thank problem. You. Is this better? Much better. Thank you. Yeah, uh, we have uh, about 80 people online, so we just want to make sure they can hear. They're very actively right. engaged. Noted. OK. okay. Yeah, so uh, what I was saying is that it's not just about self-perception amongst businesses, but the perception of, of the community of the businesses themselves. Um, we found that in media reports, you know, that there was a real lack of trust of businesses out in the disaster situation. There had been some instances where Companies were providing support, but they were providing things like outdated projects to the wrong areas, and you know this is really a lost opportunity to for the business, the private sector, to play a very uh, critical role in in helping communities rather than trying to hurt them or just like unload unwanted goods. Um, so that was important. And then about the self perception issue, uh, you know, not just Vietnam, but everywhere. So long, disaster risk management is seen as the responsibility of the government. But to really effectively engage disasters, everybody has to be seen playing a role every sector of society, and that includes the private sector. And as we've said many times, you know, businesses, and especially these small and medium enterprises, are so focused on day-to-day -day concerns, it's hard for them to see their role in longer-term planning for their own businesses as well as for the community. Um, and our project really tries to get at that with its awareness raising activities and trainings of, you know, no, you do have a critical role in this, not only for your own benefits, but for the be benefits of the community that you're operating in, for the benefits of the employees that you employ. Um, and just making those linkages clear uh, was something that we really tried to do through the trainings and, and awareness campaigns. Yeah, I think in, in Peru is uh, similar to a comment he just made. Uh, is uh, working with uh, these businesses so they can understand uh, the role that they have in the community, how important the role is in non-emergency and emergency times. Um, bear in mind that this um, district was created as of an occupation, so there's like a huge sense of community. 
main issue that we had was that they were not organized. Um, but definitely, that was one entry point that it worked well here. In other areas, there is not that much social capital. Maybe would have been more challenging, but here um, we managed to uh, get them the buy-in because they saw, like I said, the importance that they play in the community well-being. Um, what is it, uh, Henry? Um, like I said, uh, also, like I think it was very important um, the the process that we undertook uh, with the formalization of the businesses. I think they really saw the value of this, and although we need to work in Carabajo now to see what strategies can we do, so. Um, for this formalization, what are the benefits that they have? I think that we really, that's one of the main takeaways of this project, the fact that now they can operate as a legal business and then they have access to microcredit. Uh, because one of the things that in the consultations that we had at the beginning of the project is like, yes, we don't have access to any of the uh, the, the microcredits, the micro loans, um, and what we get in there like an exorbitant um, uh, interest, interest rates. So now after the formalization, working with the government that having access to not only uh, uh, micro uh, credit from uh, the Banco de Crédito de Peru, and they have established a program to do this, but also to other banks. So I think that's a very um, instant way for them to see the value of investing in DRR a little bit. Um, thank you. I'd also like to ask, I think, about maybe sort of a, a key learning moment that you guys have had in your projects or sort of something where things really didn't go as planned. Um, I know that there have been sort of assumptions that get made and then you get out there and things just don't really work the way that you thought that they would, or maybe the businesses that you're working with agree to do something and then they don't do it. Um, can you maybe talk about some, uh, maybe just one challenge point um, and how you guys got through it and how it's, it strengthens your project? Creo que eh, lo como proyecto se había planificado eh, principalmente tener un, un plan de reducción de riesgos para negocios y ayudarles con microcréditos y a través de un bono. Eso fue la planificación inicial del proyecto. La and they saw that all the time they speak Spanish. So I think the main uh, aspect of the project was to be able to provide uh, the business with both uh, microcredit, access to microcredit, and a grant as part of the project. La realidad fue que la mayor cantidad de negocios eran manejados por mujeres sin educación y sin tener eh, conciencia de lo que era un negocio. Y lo que había que hacer era fortalecer primeramente al negocio para posteriormente proceder a hacer un trabajo de reducción de riesgo y lo que habíamos pensado como proyecto. Para eso no teníamos presupuesto ni había estado contemplado dentro de la lógica. Y ahí buscamos que la empresa privada nos ayudara para, para poder cerrar este, este, esta necesidad desde el negocio. Uh, one of the main uh, issues that we had is that once we realized that um, the businesses were formalized, they didn't have any know-how on how to run their businesses, we had to come up, we had to get creative on how can we do, uh, how can we bring this capacity into the community and how can we actually do the trainings and everything when we don't have any budget for it. So and this is a problem that we encompass many times. Uh, okay. Yo quería agregar sobre la necesidad eh, de la perspectiva de los negocios. No solamente habría que ver desde los negocios, sino desde los que gerentan o, eh, o ayudan a los negocios, que es la municipalidad y nacionalmente cambió la perspectiva de que podemos trabajar reducción de riesgo y negocios. Creo que no solamente se cambió la perspectiva de trabajar reducción de riesgos con los negocios, sino con los que ayudan a los negocios, como el Estado a nivel de municipio y de eh, INDES y CENEPRED, porque entendieron de que sí se podría trabajar reducción de riesgo y negocios. Uh, so, I mean, one of the main outcomes of the project is not that we only work uh, with um, local businesses, small and medium businesses or enterprises, but we also work with those that were in charge of them. We work with, like, the municipality of Villa Salvador, the municipality of Lima, so they will be aware of the importance of bringing these uh, small and medium enterprises into the whole process of disaster risk management. So that's one of the main takeaways of the project, that it wasn't just working at the neighborhood approach, but working at different layers.
Great. Hi, this is Thea with Mercy Corps. I think one of um, we've learned quite a bit from this uh, different initiative. And I think one of the the key points is you know our initial entry point was focused around the liquidity training and capacity building of the microfinance institution, but it was you know very simple trainings, and we moved pretty quickly on to, to financial products. And the one thing that we really learned is, that, you know, as we were trying to create demand, it's a great way of putting it, you know, for, for different Indonesians, especially in these that are located in these geographies that we were targeting, for them to not only continue engaging in informal financial savings, but for them to also have the trust in engaging in formal financial institutions, especially around savings um, products. We really needed to spend much more time actually engaging with the financial institutions themselves so that there's no misplaced trust if there actually is a catastrophic disaster. So I think one of the main things that we've learned and as the initiative has um, changed throughout the, the past few years is, and as we think about uh, expansion and, and into different countries, is really our starting point would probably be focused more on this bundling this liquidity fund with um, the portfolio level insurance as an entry point, which is which is very different than the way we, we started. Um, I think your question was, uh, you know, was there one moment of, like, awareness of, like, oh, no, we're doing this wrong? Um, <laughs> I So I haven't been involved in the implementation since the start, but in my conversations with colleagues in Vietnam, one continuing realization, not just one moment, is that it's very difficult in Vietnam to work on this issue because of the lack of enabling enabling policies for private sector engagement. Um, but that said, our, our colleagues believe that even if those enabling policies don't work, doesn't mean that we shouldn't try. Um, just be, they strongly also believe that you know the government will come around and develop these incentives and frameworks to engage the private sector. But for now, our role is not to change that right away and flip the switch, but to build the capacity of the private sector to see itself as an active and committed participant in the policy and planning discussions around DRM. So our project has really focused on creating forums to do that through policy dialogues, technical workshops, through various public-private sector, I don't know, collaboration attempts. Um, and we're just seeing this as sort of doing you know, the legwork for, for if and when the government expresses readiness to engage the private sector formally, that the private sector will be prepared to do that. Thank you. Um, I think I have one more question, and then I'd love to open it up to the audience. Um, so since we are USAID's Office of Foreign Disaster Assistance, and we're the humanitarian arm of USAID, um, for us, obviously, the, the main concern is always you know, the most vulnerable um, who are going to be exposed to disasters. And I think all of your projects really come at that from a different way um, in terms of how, from a systems perspective, the people who you're working with will ultimately be benefiting those who are most at risk. Um, so maybe if you could all just say kind of a few words about how it is that you sort of came to that approach. Um, and Sia, I liked your, your resilience diagram about whose resilience are you building for what, through what. Um, I think that's maybe a nice way to frame it. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, for us, one of the things, you know, looking, you know, globally, and now we have a look at financial inclusion and financial services, obviously this initiative is really focused on the formal financial service market, but that's certainly not to take away from informal finance, because one of the things that we find over and over again, and we've done quite a bit of research in this area, um, both in Philippines after the typhoon and most recently in Nepal after the earthquake, is, is really that need for both informal financial services um, savings and access, access usually to quick credit, but also uh, what I also see, especially for very vulnerable populations, is that longer-term access to, to savings and to, to, to credit sometimes gets missed. Sometimes what will happen is there will be you know, very short-term humanitarian aid coming in, um, which sometimes actually can displace some of the financial institutions. So six months later, 12 months later, 18 months later, the financial institution actually wasn't resilient. It's no longer there. And then the larger populations are only have access to some of the informal services. Um, and so for us, one of the, the main areas that we're trying to do, because actually our end clients really are focused on the vulnerable populations, is really is, is pushing that demand for informal savings as well as formal savings as well as insurance especially this acute disaster insurance. And that's been, you know, the, the market overall in Indonesia is very small for insurance and for catastrophic insurance. It's, it's been a difficult process, but um, it's something that we've definitely prioritized within, um, within this initiative and in overall. 
Otra de las cosas para que se ha dejado a nivel, creo, nivel de barrio, nivel de población, es eh, lo que nosotros hemos llamado eh, los promotores de gestión del riesgo comunitarios. Uh, son personas que trabajan de manera voluntaria promoviendo el desarrollo en su comunidad, pero ahora con un enfoque, con el enfoque de la reducción del riesgo. Entonces, para todo Caraballo existen 120 promotores que abarca todo el territorio de Vía El Salvador. Entonces, eso creo que es dejar la resiliencia en las capacidades humanas para todo un distrito. Segundo, a nivel de institución. Okay. I think as far as resilience, it is uh, the work that we've done with uh, community volunteers that, that are part of the neighborhood uh, platforms. And the role is, uh, they're linked to the government, and the role is actually to continue promoting uh, activities on disaster risk management in their neighborhoods. Uh, and all that is not just we're doing it in Villa Salvador. Uh, we have created, uh, one of the main issues that we had at the beginning was, uh, I mentioned that um, the Sina Hair Law actually established uh, mechanisms for uh, municipal, re uh, regional and municipal governments to uh, do the disaster risk management, but there was a disconnect with neighborhoods. Uh, we created this uh, manual that is actually being uh, institutionalized and is part of the curriculum now of the Investing in Center Prep on how to uh, do uh, disaster risk management at neighborhood level. Also in Villa Salvador, they're actually replicating this in two areas, in Cerro de, in, ter in Territorio Chu, which is another area, and Cerro de la Papa. Cerro de la Papa. So the municipality is, con is continuing to do this work. Um, eh, otra, otra forma de generar resiliencia es dejar instrumentos municipales que más allá de que se cambien las personas, esos instrumentos van a ayudar al municipio a reducir el riesgo, como el ROF uh, y el dentro del plan de desarrollo concertado. I think they've both gotten at what I was going to say, but essentially the way we access or reach vulnerable communities is through these businesses that employ so much of the people living in highly um, hazard-prone areas. And um, I think we aim to build community resilience through through the private sector, but the end client is ultimately the population. Um, that's what I Thank you. I'm going to turn it over to Dana now and the Microlinks team so that we can take questions from the audience both here and online. Great. Thanks to all of you. Can you hear me fine? Yeah? Good. OK, so yeah, we're going to open it up to all of you for our Q&A period now. And we're going to alternate between um, the room and our online audience as far as taking questions. So um, please just raise your hand if you're in the room. And either myself or my colleague Madeline will pass you a microphone. And please just make sure to speak into the microphone so that our online audience can hear. So I think. We'll start with one in the room, and then I'll pass it to our uh, moderator online. Ellen, please introduce yourself. Hi, I'm James Hochschwander with Crown Agency USA. Um, my question is to both USAID as well as all of you. Institutionally, I'm hearing some of your lessons learned are things that were learned in microfinance years ago. And I know sometimes humanitarian assistance doesn't get married well enough with the other parts of the organizations that have already learned those things. And so both from the USAID viewpoint of when you're financing a program and the design and this, that, and the other thing, that those lessons learned from other parts of the agency um, are being incorporated. For example, um, when you say that you didn't realize how much um, business skills development is needed in these enterprises, that's not something new. Promoher, for decades, has incorporated that as basic part of their um, solidarity group lending curriculum. So we don't have to reinvent those materials and things like that. So I'm just wondering, what are you doing within your respective agencies to bridge between humanitarian assistance, which the left disaster relief definitely falls within, while bringing in the, the wealth of, of knowledge and experience in other parts. Um, I can answer briefly from the OFDA side, and then I'll turn over, I think, to my colleagues. Um, 
I mean, from our side, uh, I myself actually come from the microfinance community, so bridging development to humanitarian, I suppose, a bit. Um, and certainly I think some of it was that we can, like you said, right, we can pull materials from those things already. So it's not as though, you know, a wholly new curriculum had to be developed. It's, you know, okay, this already exists. Um, I think, I know Save the Children partnered with an existing microfinance bank. I think a lot of folks were, let's use what's already out there. Um, let's adapt it to this particular context. What I find really interesting, um, I think, is that the lessons are learned and that the materials are out there. But to me, what I found is that everything is so context specific. Um, you can know going into a project that you're going to have to adapt and that it will take a long time to build your partnership and that you're going to have to start with businesses where they are. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you don't have to go through the hard work of what is it exactly that these particular businesses need. Um, how do I adapt you know, this great curriculum that already exists on getting small businesses prepared for disasters or basic business skills? How do I adapt it to these people in this particular context? Um, and I think that's, that's at least the lesson for me, is that that still takes the time. Um, there have been so many times when we've said, hey, there's this great resource already out there. Why don't you use that? And they're like, yes, we are going to use it, but we still need to adapt it to our context if we're going to make it work. Um, and the time and the effort that that takes, I think, has been my lesson learned. Um, I don't know if others want to share. Hi, this is Thea with Mercy Corps. Obviously, this specific initiative does work with, with microfinance. And one of the things that we did find is that with a lot of the, the microfinance institutions that we work with, again, that means quite a bit in Indonesia, cooperatives, commercial banks, is that you know, most of them you know, were following, had, had been you know, trained on microfinance best practices with cash reserve, loan loss policies, uh, loan restructuring policies. But they really weren't sufficient when we're talking about catastrophic disaster. And so that's, that's really been where we've taken what we've learned from microfinance, but really made it very specific to these specific types of disasters. And linking, I would say, linking to the humanitarian, I mean, obviously this is Mercy Corps, we've got, we've got several arms, and one of our largest arms is around um, humanitarian assistance. And, you know, one of the things that, that we do quite a bit and is around cash. And so, especially in catastrophic disaster, there is usually, hopefully more and more, <laughs> cash put into the system rather than, you know, direct, direct food aid in, in different types of um, delivery channels. And so we actually see quite a wonderful partnership between humanitarian assistance and, for example, longer term um, development, especially when we're working with certain different financial institutions. Because, you know, for example, if, if the cash can also be targeted, for example, at some of the vulnerable communities that have these outstanding loans, it, one, it takes uh, the pressure off the debt of the specific individual, then it also allows the, the financial institution to, to have different liquidity. So there actually is a partnership, but these partnerships usually need to be arranged in advance. It's very difficult to do directly after. So I think especially places like Vietnam and Indonesia and obviously in parts of Peru where we know there's, especially when we're talking about catastrophic disasters or high winds, rains, these happen every year when these partnerships can be informed in advance. It's a win-win both for the communities as well as the financial institutions. Okay, so I think, is there a question from our online audience? Okay, we have about 80 people online um, and an active discussion going on. Um, one question that I thought was interesting that came in from Matthew Marzola, um, and it, it could be directed to any of the presenters, um, is that disasters can affect so many different value chains, affecting people in a wide variety of ways, um, examples, labor, food, finance, et cetera. How did your programs prioritize specific value chains as those necessary for the recovery of local livelihoods and other needs? Lo primero que, lo primero que hicimos fue eh, aplicar una herramienta, lo conocen Emma, Uh, y se hizo muy de la mano con la propia oficina de desarrollo económico local y participación vecinal para poder definir el espacio con mayor vulnerabilidad dentro de un territorio y a partir de ahí se identificaron los servicios o bienes más críticos para esta población. 
in the main, uh, the tool that we used to define these uh, key marks and services was the, uh, the, EMMA, the EMMA tool. And we use it in coordination with um, the local development uh, um, economic uh, office, also with uh, the whole municipality. Um, that's how we identify actually seven key services and markets uh, that then we decided they will be the ones that we will prioritize uh, during the whole project activities. Yeah, I actually had the, the great pleasure of being in VL Salvador on the day when they did the community workshop. Um, and it was, it was really quite impressive. They brought together a really wide segment of the community and sort of talked through, okay, if a disaster is going to happen, what are the things that you guys need most? Um, both sort of what are the things that you need most critically, right, like food and shelter, um, but also, you know, how are you going to get around? So, like, um, the motorcycle taxis that everybody takes really came out as one particular strong thing, which we wouldn't have necessarily thought of beforehand, um, as well as, you know, what would you need for recovery? What are the types of items that you would want? So they focused on hardware stores, for example, selling things like flashlights and fire extinguishers. Um, and it was really very impressive, the, the kinds of things that people thought of and then how they, they narrowed it down together as a community um, to focus on the key markets. It was, it was really quite a powerful thing to be at. Um, see, I know you have lots to say, too, about how the financial services market affects so many critical market systems. I don't know if you want to. <laughs> sure. uh, just briefly, um, when I say SMEs, of course, that means a broad range of sectors within that. And I think the way we tar decided which to focus on was just by virtue of where they're located, the ones that were located right along the coast had aquaculture industries that we were really focused on. And so, of course, we adapted the training to that. In some areas, agriculture was more important. In the cities like Da Nang and Ho Chi Minh City, there were other service sector and then technology industries and manufacturing that was more important. So just by virtue of location, we adapted the training to meet the local needs. Great. Is there another question here in the room? Hi, can everybody hear me? Yeah, this is Andre Mershon from the Center for Resilience at USAID. Thank you all for the presentations, excellent. I learned a lot. Um, it gives us a lot to think about in terms of the financial side of the house. Um, and we've been more focused on our work on Africa, so to get the examples from Asia and Latin America is very helpful. Um, I actually wanted to direct the question to my colleague from AFTA. Um, these are really interesting examples. Can you give us a little more sense of what the overall AFTA uh, investment portfolio and this looks like in terms of, you know, resources, scope, et cetera. Um, and, you know, these are good examples, but what does the larger effort look like? Thank you. You caught me horribly off guard. <laughs> There's no loyalty, guys. Um, <laughs> um, so in a typical year, um, and I don't want to say for sure with fiscal year 15 because it was so crazy with Ebola funding. Um, but in a typical year, OFTA dedicates around 10 to 15 percent of its portfolio to disaster risk reduction. Um, but this covers everything from um, building up the capacity of national and local disaster risk management bodies. So for example, um, we've had a lot of success actually in Latin America and the Caribbean um, and in parts of Southeast Asia as well. Um, and there have been disasters where we as USAID either don't have to respond or we do a very small response because the national and local governments have it, um, which to us is a terrific success. Um, a lot of this is also sort of very local community-based things. Um, some of this might be um, having better early warning systems so that we know um, when something's going to happen so that communities are aware and then they know who to feed up to as well because it's not very much to be aware of, you know, let's say that a drought's coming or flooding um, or a storm if there's not anything that you can do about it. Um, so making sure then that they have that link so that there's some way that they can alert the authorities and have action, um, as well as sort of what I would call the more market-driven disaster risk reduction activities as well. Um, all of these are sort of multi-year initiatives, um, so they're not all reflected in our current year's funding. Um, if you are interested, and for those online as well, and I'll make sure that we've got a link for microlinks um, each year we put out an annual summary of all of our disaster risk production programs, and then we also have um, regionally focused ones. So if you're interested in a particular region, then we'll summarize for the past year or the past few years um, some particular disaster risk reduction projects that we've had there. Um, I apologize for not having a specific number on the top of my head. 
Um, apologies. All right, so back to the webinar room quickly, and then we'll come back in the room. So this is a question that came from um, a couple of different people, Jerry Brown um, and Kiel Amason. Um, they were interested in sort of the, the statement that resilience program requires a flexible approach um, and also um, some of the experiences of working with formal businesses. And they were wondering um, if you could speak a little bit more about how your programs um, have worked with more informal um, businesses in the context in which you've been working. Bueno, uh, para el tema de la formalización con los mercados, eh, lo que hicimos, una condición para que los mercados o los mercados de abastos o los pequeños negocios puedan acceder a un microcrédito o a un bono, era que deberían cumplir ciertas reglas que el propio municipio les exigía. Y uno de eso era el tener certificados de, de, de seguridad, tener eh, todo el tema saneado con la SUNAT, entonces como proyecto se ayudó a formalizarles para que puedan acceder al microcrédito y al tema del bono. Entonces, inicial, eh, no, se les, no se fue con el mensaje de que formalízate, sino primero hay muchas ventajas y hay todo un programa para ti y cuando ellos empezaron a entender que había ventajas, el tema de la formalización fue mucho más fácil. Uh, one of the main ob um, issues that we dealt with this project was uh, the level of um, informal uh, businesses in this area. You have been muted. Your microphone has been turned on. Is it? Okay. Sorry. Um, it was uh, working with uh, this informal um, uh, business that we had. Uh, and I think we took an approach, uh, not just like, okay, you guys need to formalize because this is part of the legislation of Villa Salvador, but it was like actually trying to uh, show the value that it will have in their business to go through the process, not only just because they were ticking the boxes with the municipality or because they will be able to apply to the microcredits uh, or to the grants, but to, to actually uh, make them uh, understand what will be the impact that it will have in their business and how their business will have an impact in the well-being of the uh, neighborhood. Um, this is Toral uh, from the Asia Foundation. In Vietnam, I think our training program definitely uh, focused on formal businesses, but I think through our broader media and communications campaign, we hope that these messages would be disseminated to the informal sector, um, but that is something that we haven't directly targeted in our, in our past five years. Hi, this is Thea with, with Mercy Corps. Um, yeah, I think it's a really good question. I mean, with us, especially when we talk about the client-level microinsurance products, we work with several different insurance carriers. And when um, people actually t take on the insurance product, they, again, this is specifically looking at catastrophic risk insurance, they have the option to insure their physical business or their household, which is often the case that's used for um, more of the informal businesses. Okay, so we have about seven or so more minutes, so I think we'll have one more question here in the room and then maybe one more from online and then we'll wrap up. Thank you, not to hog the microphone, but James Hochschwender from Crown Agency USA. I, I have to admit and thank you for presenting uh, what you did about the complexity of trying to develop resilience uh, in the face of disasters because it's not a simple thing. It is multidisciplinary. Um, so I'm going to complicate it a little bit more uh, by asking to what extent, because this is coming up in other areas, um, is the use of modern technologies being incorporated into what you're doing? Because in disaster relief, just straight disaster relief, use of mobile phones and other things like that. If you could touch upon that. That'd be good. Hi, this is Thea with Mercy Corps. It's, it's, it's a huge part of what Mercy Corps does. Obviously, I'm not our, our, um, our 
GPS mapping specialist, so I can't get into too many details, but it is something that we focus on. And again, looking at it from a uh, financial services side, um, one of the things that you know, we're actually a leader in is digital financial services in emergencies for, for cash distribution using digital channels. And in Indonesia, for this specific initiative, uh, we haven't been able to use that so much. But again, part of that's actually had to do with some of the, the regulations and limitations in larger infrastructure. But there have been some recent changes in uh, branches banking laws in Indonesia, which is actually allowing us now, as we think about the next phase, to, to incorporate that. Because obviously, um, when we're talking about people being able to access cash, it'd be much easier if people could access cash if, you know, if the infrastructure is there after disaster through digital means versus having to, to go to a bank branch. So that's actually one of our priorities moving forward in this initiative. Um, for this program in particular in Vietnam, we've made all the training materials available online and created a virtual platform to make sure that these are accessible to a wider audience. And we've also engaged social media. Um, but that's, I guess, at this stage in the 21st century, it's pretty, like, basic. Uh, I'll speak to our other DRM programs that, that the Asia Foundation has. Uh, we're currently working in Thailand to create a DRM data API to make this uh, critical data more accessible across government agencies that are working on, on disaster risk management and also to the community because I think in Thailand that's been a real issue in, in terms of sharing information. Um, but for the purposes of the Vietnam Project right now, we're using social media and, and that's been super effective. I think uh, answering to your question, uh, not in uh, Villa El Salvador, not in this project, but in the new project we have in Caraballo, uh, Save the Children actually uh, got funds from a different donor to do a, a GIS mapping uh, for all project uh, employees, also municipal uh, level authorities. So all the work that we're doing in the field, anything that is done for the neighborhood level uh, um, during the risk mapping, everything is collected through GPS and process in the office, and it actually goes and fits into uh, this database that is done at the central level called CGRIP, which is, uh, I'm going to translate it as I go, uh, it's a geo-reference information system for risk reduction in Peru. So all the information that we're actually uh, getting from the project is what it should be going there. <laughs> and just, it's going there. And like I said, it's good because it gives, we're working with, like I said, project staff, also uh, with uh, neighborhood platforms so they can actually review this data and send the data very easily using Google Earth because what we want to do is technology, innovation. We use that very easily. Um, we want to use uh, this innovation, these uh, ways for the communities to work with the GPS. So it's actually low, uh, low technology, low maintenance, and they can actually use it themselves. So. Um, what we created is, like I said, the system that they can just redo their maps every six to eight months, identify new risks, identify new hazards, and then just send it to the municipality, and then it fits into the CGRIP um, uh, database. So that's the idea it creates, because the risk keeps changing. So that's what we're doing uh, in this project. Not in Villa El Salvador, but we brought into Caraballo. One last question from our online audience. I thought this was an interesting question um, from Demba, and she was speaking a little bit to cultural understanding um, in different countries of disaster, disaster risk reduction um, and how it isn't as um, prevalent or prominent in some cultures and countries. And so I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more about how your different programs address any cultural resistance um, for disaster risk reduction. Hi, this is Athea again with Mercy Corps. Yeah, this has actually been a really interesting area. I was just out in, in December visiting our, our, our different program um, partners out there. And one of the things that, that I observed is that in conversations both with the financial institutions as well with, with clients is people are very open, easily talking about wind damage, flooding damage, fire damage. But when we talk about the catastrophic disasters such as volcanoes and earthquakes, the, the conversation always changed very dramatically. And a lot of it had to do with, um, this is a very generalization, but talking about karma. So bringing up the earthquakes, bringing up the volcanoes with potentially you know, bad karma on, on talking about it, whereas we didn't find that with some of the, the regular disasters that were happening, which has been a really interesting as we think about um, how do we quote unquote market those products. And obviously, a lot of the partners that we're working with are Indonesian insurance agencies that are acutely aware of some of these differences. And actually, we're about to, um, because it is such an interesting topic, and if, if that is an issue, how do we how do we go about that with the, 
designs of the products and, again, really the, the marketing and how these products are described. Um, one of the things we're doing is actually launching some, some research right about that right now. Which, yeah, which will be ready in a couple months. We're excited to, to share that. Para el caso peruano, son 40 años que se ha trabajado con la cultura de respuesta a la emergencia. Es decir, preparémonos porque viene el sismo o viene el huaico o viene el río. Pero... <laughs> In Perú, for the last 40 years, they've been, uh, they have, like I said, in one of my points, a very a reactive approach. So for the last 40 years, there's been a lot of like, okay, so we're exposed to uh, earthquakes, we're exposed to landslides. It's coming, pretty much. That's it. Entonces, el, cuando vamos con este mensaje, ¿se puede trabajar acciones para reducir el riesgo o para prevenir generar otros riesgos, no solamente desde el gobierno con política, sino a nivel del barrio, pensando en que cuando construyes la pista, construyes el, el, el parque, construyes un espacio público, también podemos plantear cosas para reducir el riesgo, para prevenir el riesgo, pero también puede ayudar para prepararlos. Eso es, creo, el gran reto y se está logrando con el trabajo a nivel de lo más bajo, pero también con los que toman las decisiones y hacen las políticas. I think, uh, I mean, the most important thing is uh, um, talking to grassroots levels, to communities, to like neighborhood platforms on the importance of, okay, yes, we live in an area where we are prone to earthquakes, uh, to landslides, uh, but there's things that we can do. Uh, preparedness is important, okay? But then we're like sitting ducks. We need to know, like, uh, it is our decision. It is our, uh, the, we need to be part of the process of identifying these risks. And what can we do as an individual, as a community, as a municipality of Villa Salvador, to undertake activities to reduce this risk, to mitigate this risk, to adapt to the risk? Uh, for a long time, uh, we talk about, okay, we're doing DRR work, and we're just doing preparedness. Or maybe we're doing a risk assessment, but we're not doing any of the management part of it. I think the most important part is, I think it is important when you do risk assessment, and you identify, okay, you live in an area of high risk, great. If you don't do anything, you create an area of panic. And if you go to Peru and you actually look at the, uh, the newspapers, they have like these old uh, newsstands with all the newspapers with the front page in there, and you can just see like, an earthquake is coming. If it happens in Lima, 75,000 people will die. So it's also part of the culture that is very, a little bit uh, traumatic. I think one of the important parts of the, no, it is, I mean, I guess it's the Latino in us. Uh, I think it is important that people can be uh, part of the uh, understanding the risk and coming up with activities that they can do to reduce it. Um, when we work with Save the Children at school level, a community level, uh, we work with uh, the committees at like I said, school or community level to, so they can identify through a process, through a participatory process of what are those risks that they're exposed to. Then they come up with some activities that they can do to reduce those risks. Some of them, they can be undertaken by the own school, by the own individual. Some of them will be done with maybe some part of the funds that we're giving them to the project. Some others is linking them with other stakeholders that they can support them. And this is what we're doing, and I think I'm just going to go into like a closing statement of my, my thing here, but it's the most important thing of the project it is understanding that, yes, we identify the risk, but there's also avenues that we can actually continue getting funding for these activities. And that's what we were talking about, like those programs that exist at the central level, the PP68 and the Phony Prel, to continue bringing, like I said, sources for communities and for municipalities to undertake risk management activities. Um, I think my co-presenters have done a really great job of summarizing some of the issues that Vietnam also faces in terms of understanding disaster. Um, again, you know, living in, in high-risk areas, there's this acceptance that this is just the way it is and, you know, this is what we've deal been dealing with and the sort of reluctance to actually plan for uncertain events that may or may not affect them. Um, so that was the real challenge in incorporating the trainings of, you know, convincing them that, yes, this is, this is actually a risk that can be managed through these various tools and resources and strategies. Um, and so getting around that cultural understanding of like, this is just something we deal with to, yes, but we can also, we can also navigate this in a more graceful way that's beneficial to everyone. Okay, well, I think that just about wraps up today's event. Thanks very much to Laura and to our presenters, Toral, Sia, Henry, and Jorge, for their excellent presentations. And thanks to those of you here in person and online for your contributions as well. Um, just to let you know, you can expect post-event resources from this presentation to be available on the event page in about a week's time. Um, on microlinks.org, just visit the site and you'll find the event page. Um, and if you registered for this event, you should also be getting um, an email 
listing the resources for you there as well. So with that, um, thanks once again and enjoy the rest of your day.